This is a recording of Summit Curriculum English 910 Explorations in Literature, page 142. The narrative nonfiction is entitled Goodbye to All That by Joan Didion. How many miles to Babylon? Three score miles and ten. Can I get there by candlelight? Yes, and back again. If your feet are nimble and light, you can get there by candlelight. It is easy to see the beginnings of things and harder to see the ends. I can remember now with a clarity that makes the nerves in the back of my neck constrict when New York began for me, but I cannot lay my finger upon the moment it ended, can never cut through the ambiguities and second starts and broken resolves to the exact place on the page where the heroine is no longer as optimistic as she once was. When I first saw New York, I was 20, and it was summertime, and I got off a DC-7 at the old Idlewild temporary terminal in a new dress which had seemed very smart in Sacramento, but seemed less smart already. Even in the old Idlewild temporary terminal, and the warm air smelled of mildew and some instinct programmed by all the movies I had ever seen and all the songs I had ever heard sung and all the stories I had ever read about New York informed me that it would never be quite the same again. In fact, it never was. Some time later, there was a song on all the jukeboxes on the Upper East Side that went, but where is the schoolgirl who used to be me? And if it was late enough at night, I used to wander that. I know now that almost everyone wanders something like that, sooner or later, and no matter what he or she is doing. But one of the mixed blessings of being 20 and 21 and even 23 is the conviction that nothing, page 143, like this, all evidence to the contrary notwithstanding, has ever happened to anyone before. Of course, it might have been some other city, had circumstances been different and the time been different, and had I been different, might have been Paris or Chicago or even San Francisco. But because I'm talking about myself, I am talking here about New York. The first night I opened my window on the bus in town and watched for the skyline, that all I could see were the wastes of Queens and the big signs that said Midtown Tunnel, this lane, and then a flood of summer rain. Even that seemed remarkable and exotic, for I had come out of the West where there was no summer rain. And for the next three days, I sat wrapped in blankets in a hotel room air conditioned to 35 degrees and tried to get over a bad cold and a high fever. It did not occur to me to call a doctor, because I knew none, and although it did occur to me to call the desk and ask that the air conditioner be turned off, I never called, because I did not know how much to tip whoever might come. Was anyone ever so young? I'm here to tell you that someone was. All I could do during those three days was talk long distance to a boy I already knew I would never marry in the spring. I would stay in New York, I told him, just six months, and I could see the Brooklyn Bridge from my window. As it turned out, the bridge was the Triboro, and I stayed eight years. In retrospect, it seems to me that those days before I knew the names of all the bridges were happier than the ones that came later. But perhaps you will see that as we go along. Part of what I want to tell you is what it is like to be young in New York, how six months can become eight years with the deceptive ease of a film dissolve, for that is how those years appear to me now, in a long sequence of sentimental dissolves and old-fashioned trick shots, the Seagram building fountains dissolve into snowflakes. I enter a revolving door at 20 and come out a good deal older and on a different street but most particularly I want to explain to you, and in the process, perhaps to myself, why I no longer live in New York. It is often said that New York is a city for only the very rich and the very poor. It is less often said that New York is also at least for, page 144,
those of us who came there from somewhere else, a city for only the very young. I remember once, one cold, bright December evening in New York, suggesting to a friend who complained of having been around too long that he come with me to a party where there would be, I assured him with the bright resourcefulness of 23, new faces. He laughed literally until he choked, and I had to roll down the taxi window and hit him on the back. New faces, he said finally. Don't tell me about new faces. It seemed that the last time he had gone to a party where he had been promised new faces, there had been 15 people in the room, and he had already slept with five of the women and owed money to all but two of the men. I laughed with him, but the first snow had just begun to fall, and the big Christmas trees glittered yellow and white as far as I could see up Park Avenue, and I had a new dress, and it would be a long while before I would come to understand the particular moral of the story. It would be a long while because, quite simply, I was in love with New York. I do not mean love in any colloquial way. I mean that I was in love with the city, the way you love the first person who ever touches you and never love anyone quite that way again. I remember walking across 62nd Street one twilight that first spring, or the second spring, they were all alike for a while. I was late to meet someone, but I stopped at Lexington Avenue and bought a peach and stood at the corner eating it and knew that I had come out of the West and reached the mirage. I could taste the peach and feel the soft air blowing from a subway grating on my legs, and I could smell lilac and garbage and expensive perfume, and I knew that it would cost something sooner or later, because I did not belong there, did not come from there. But when you are 22 or 23, you figure that later you will have a high emotional balance and be able to pay whatever it costs. I still believed in possibilities then, still had the sense, so peculiar in New York, that something extraordinary would happen any minute, any day, any month. I was making only $65 or $70 a week then, Put yourself in Hattie Carnegie's hands, I would was advised without. Page 145. The slightest trace of irony by an editor of the magazine for which I worked. So little money that some weeks I had to charge food at Bloomingdale's gourmet shop in order to eat. A fact which went unmentioned in the letters I wrote to California. I never told my father that I needed money, because then he would have sent it, and I would never know if I could do it by myself. At that time, making a living seemed a game to me, with arbitrary but quite inflexible rules. And except a certain kind of winter evening, 6.30 in the 70s, say, already dark and bitter with a wind off the river, when I would be walking very fast toward a bus and would look in the bright windows of brown stones and see cooks working in clean kitchens and imagine women lighting candles on the floor above and beautiful children being bathed on the floor above that. Except on nights like those, I never felt poor. I had the feeling that if I needed money, I could always get it. I could write a syndicated column for teenagers under the name Debbie Lynn, or I could smuggle gold into India, or I could become a $100 call girl, and none of it would matter. Nothing was irrevocable. Everything was within reach. Just around every corner lay something curious and interesting, something I had never before seen or done or known about. I could go to a party and meet someone who called himself Mr. Emotional Appeal, and ran the Emotional Appeal Institute or Tina Onassis Blanford or a Florida cracker who was then a regular on what he called the Big C, the Southampton El Morocco circuit. I'm well connected on the Big C, honey. He would tell me over colored greens on his vast borrowed terrace or the widow of the salary king of the Harlem market or a piano salesman from Bon Terre, Missouri or someone who had already made and lost two fortunes in Midland, Texas. I could make promises to myself and to other people, and there would be all the time in the world to keep them. 
I could stay up all night and make mistakes and none of it would count. You see, I was in a curious position in New York. It never occurred to me that I was living a real life there. In my imagination, I, page 146, was always there for just another few months, just until Christmas or Easter or the first warm day in May. For that reason, I was most comfortable in the company of Southerners. They seemed to be in New York as I was, on some indefinitely extended leave from wherever they belonged, disinclined to consider the future. Temporary exiles who always knew when the flights left for New Orleans or Memphis or Richmond or, in my case, California. Someone who lives always with a plane schedule in the drawer lives on a slightly different calendar. Christmas, for example, was a difficult season. Other people could take it in stride, going to Stowe or going abroad or going for the day to their mother's places in Connecticut. Those of us who believed that we lived somewhere else would spend it making and canceling airline reservations, waiting for weather-bound flights as if for the last plane out of Lisbon in 1940, and finally comforting one another, those of us who were left with the oranges and mementos and smoked oyster stuffings of childhood, gathering close, colonials in a far country. Which is precisely what we were. I am not sure that it is possible for anyone brought up in the East to appreciate entirely what New York, the idea of New York, means to those of us who came out of the West and the South. To an Eastern child, particularly a child who has always had an uncle on Wall Street and who has spent several hundred Saturdays first at FAO Swartz and being fitted for shoes at best and then waiting under the Biltmore clock dancing to Lester Lannan, New York is just a city, albeit the city, a plausible place for people to live. But to those of us who came from places where no one had heard of Lester Lannan and Grand Central Station was a Saturday radio program where Wall Street and Fifth, page 147, Avenue and Madison Avenue were not places at all but abstractions, money and high fashion and the hucksters. New York was no mere city. It was instead an infinitely romantic notion, the mysterious nexus of all love and money and power, the shining and perishable dream itself. To think of living there was to reduce to miraculous to the mundane. One does not live at Xanadu. In fact, it was difficult in the extreme for me to understand those young women for whom New York was not simply an ephemeral estoril, but a real place girls who bought toasters and installed new cabinets in their apartments and committed themselves to some reasonable future. I never bought any furniture in New York. For a year or so, I lived in other people's apartments. After that, I lived in the 90s in an apartment furnished entirely with things taken from storage by a friend whose wife had moved away. And when I left the apartment in the 90s, that was when I was leaving everything, when it was all breaking up. I left everything in it, even my winter clothes and the map of Sacramento County I had hung on the bedroom wall to remind me who I was. And I moved into a monastic four-room floor through on 75th Street. Monastic is perhaps misleading here, implying some chic severity, until after I was married and my husband moved some furniture in. There was nothing at all in those four rooms except a cheap double mattress and box springs ordered by telephone the day I decided to move and two French garden chairs lent me by a friend who imported them. It strikes me now that the people I knew in New York all had curious and self-defeating sidelines. The imported garden chairs, which did not sell very well at Hamaker Schlemmer or they tried to market hair straighteners in Harlem, or they ghosted exposés of Murder Incorporated for Sunday supplements. I think that perhaps none of us was very serious, engage only about our most private lives. Page 148. All I ever did to that apartment was hang 50 yards of yellow theatrical silk across the bedroom windows, because I had some idea that the gold light would make me feel better. 
but it did not bother to weigh the curtains correctly and all that summer the long panels of transparent golden silk would blow out the windows and get tangled and drenched in the afternoon thunderstorms. That was the year, my 28th, when I was discovering that not all of the promises would be kept, that some things are in fact irrevocable, and that it had counted after all. Every evasion and every procrastination, every mistake, every word, all of it. That is what it was all about, wasn't it? Promises? Now when New York comes back to me, it comes in hallucinatory flashes, so clinically detailed that I sometimes wish that memory would affect the distortion with which it is commonly credited. For a lot of the time I was in New York, I used a perfume called Fleur de Rocal, and then Le Air du Temps, and now the slightest trace of either can short circuit my connections for the rest of the day. Nor can I smell Henry Bendel jasmine soap without falling back into the past or the particular mixture of spices used for boiling crabs. There were barrels of crab boil in a check place in the 80s where I once shopped. Smells, of course, are notorious memory stimuli, but there are other things which affect me the same way. Blue and white striped sheets, vermouth, cassis, some faded nightgowns which were new in 1959 or 1960, and some chiffon scarves I bought about the same time. I suppose that a lot of us who have been young in New York have the same scenes on our home screens. I remember sitting in a lot of apartments with a slight headache about five o'clock in the morning. I had a friend who could not sleep, and he knew a few other people who had the same time trouble. And we would watch the sky lighten and have a last drink with no ice and then go home in the early morning light. When the streets were clean and wet, had it rained in the night? We never knew. And the few, page 149. Cruising taxis still had their headlights on, and the only color was the red and green of traffic signals. The white rose bars opened very early in the morning. I recall waiting in one of them to watch an astronaut go into space, waiting so long that at the moment it actually happened, I had my eyes not on a television screen, but on a cockroach on the tile floor. I liked the bleak branches above Walt Washington Square at dawn and the monochromatic flatness of Second Avenue, the fire escapes and the grilled storefronts, particular and empty in their perspective. It is relatively hard to fight at 6.30 or 7 in the morning without any sleep, which was perhaps one reason we stayed up all night, and it seemed to me a pleasant time of day. The windows were shuttered in that apartment in the 90s, and I could sleep a few hours and then go to work. I could work then on two or three hours sleep and a container of coffee from chock full of nuts. I liked going to work liked the soothing and satisfactory rhythm of getting out a magazine, liked the orderly progression of four-color closings and two-color closings and black-and-white closings, and then the product. No abstraction, but something which looked effortlessly glossy and could be picked up on a newsstand and weighed in the hand. I liked all the minute of proofs and layouts, liked working late on the nights the magazine went to press, sitting and reading variety and waiting for the cop copy call to copy desk to call. From my office I could look across town to the weather signal on the mutual of New York building and the lights that alternately spelled out time and life above Rockefeller Plaza. That pleased me obscurely, and so did walking uptown in the mauve eight o'clocks of early summer evenings and looking at things. Low stuff terrines in 57th Street windows, people in evening clothes trying to get taxis, trees just coming into full leaf, the lambent air, all the sweet promises of money in summer. Some years passed, but I still did not lose that sense of wonder about New York. I began to cherish the loneliness of it, the sense that at any given time, no one need know where I was or what I was doing. I liked walking from the East River over to the Hudson. Page 150.
and back on brisk days, down around the village on warm days. A friend would leave me the key to her apartment in the West Village when she was out of town, and sometimes I would just move down there, because by the time the telephone was beginning to bother me, the canker, you see, was already in the rows, and not many people had that number. I remember one day when someone who did have the West Village number came to pick me up lunch there, and we both had hangovers, and I cut my finger opening him a can of beer and burst into tears. And we walked to a Spanish restaurant and drank Bloody Marys and gazpacho until we felt better. It was not then guilt-ridden about spending afternoons that way, because I still had all the afternoons in the world. And even that late in the game, I still liked going to parties, all parties, bad parties, Saturday afternoon parties, given by recently married couples who lived in Steuben's town, West Side parties given by unpublished or failed writers who served cheap red wine and talked about going to Guadalajara. Village parties where all the guests worked for advertising agencies and voted for reform Democrats. Press parties at Sardis, the worst kind of parties. You will have perceived by now that I was not one to profit by the experience of others. That it was a very long time indeed before I stopped believing in new faces and began to understand the lesson in that story, which was that it is distinctly possible to stay too long at the fair. I could not tell you when I began to understand that. All I know is that it was very bad when I was 28. Everything that was said to me I seemed to have heard before, and I could no longer listen. I could no longer sit in little bars near Grand Central and listen to someone complaining of his wife's inability to cope with the help while he missed another train to Connecticut. I no longer had any interest in hearing about the advances of other people had received from their publishers, about plays which were having second act trouble in Philadelphia, or about people I would like very much if only I would come out and meet them. I, page 151 had already met them, always. There were certain parts of the city which I had to avoid. I could not bear Upper Madison Avenue on weekday mornings. This was a particularly inconvenient aversion, since I then lived just 50 or 60 feet east of Madison, because I would see women walking Yorkshire Terriers and shopping at Gristie's, and some Vebelnesque gourd would rise in my throat. I could not go to Times Square in the afternoon or the New York Public Library for any reason whatsoever. One day I could not go into Schraff's. The next day it would be Bonwit Teller. I hurt the people I cared about, insulted those I did not. I cut myself off from the one person who was closer to me than any other. I cried until I was not even aware when I was crying, and when I was not, cried in elevators and in taxis and in Chinese laundries. And then when I went to the doctor, he said only I seemed to be depressed and should see a specialist. He wrote down a psychiatrist's name and address for me, but I did not go. Instead, I got married, which as it turned out was a very good thing to do, but badly timed since I still could not walk on Upper Madison Avenue in the mornings and still could not talk to people and still cried in Chinese laundries. I had never before understood what despair meant, and I am not sure that I understand now, but I understood that year. Of course, I could not work. I could not even get dinner with any degree of certainty, and I would sit in the apartment on 75th Street, paralyzed until my husband would call from his office and say gently that I did not have to get dinner, that I could meet him at Michael's Pub or at Toots Shore or at Sardi's East. And then one morning in April, we had been married in January, he called and told me that he wanted to get out of New York for a while that he would take a six-month leave of absence, that we would go somewhere. It was three years ago that he told me that, and we lived in Los Angeles since. Many of the people we knew in New York think this is a curious aberration, and in fact, tell us so. There is no, page 152, possible, no adequate answer to that, 
And so we give certain stock answers, the answers everyone gives. I talk about how difficult it would be for us to afford to live in New York right now, about how much space we need. All I mean is that I was very young in New York, and that at some point the golden rhythm was broken, and I am not that young anymore. The last time I was in New York was in a cold January, and everyone was ill and tired. Many of the people I used to know there had moved to Dallas or had gone on Antibus or had bought a farm in New Hampshire. We stayed 10 days, and then we took an afternoon flight back to Los Angeles. And on the way home from the airport that night, I could see the moon on the Pacific and smell jasmine all around, and we both knew that there was no longer any point in keeping the apartment we still kept in New York. There were years when I called Los Angeles the coast, but they seem a long time ago.